Welcome to the May 12th regularly scheduled Midland Public School Board of Education meeting. If everyone could make sure that their cell phones are turned off before <coughs> we start, I would really appreciate it. We welcome everyone tonight. Um, we have a full house. This is fabulous. If you would all rise and join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, now do roll call. Uh, let's see, President Wasserman is not here. Vice President Grandstad here. Secretary Gorton, I'm here. Treasurer Kaminsky. Here. Member Baker. Here. Member McFarland. Here. Member Singer. Here. So we have six out of seven. <clears throat> all right, next up we have our consent agenda. I'll just read through all the items. Item 2.1 is approval of the regular meeting minutes from the April 14th, 2014 meeting and the budget workshop, which was held on April 28th, 2014. 2.2 um, .2 is um, Following staff members have announced their resignations. 2.3 is bids were requested and sent to seven vendors for um, multi-purpose copy paper. Five responded and the results indicated on the bid tabulation sheet and we recommend purchasing the paper from Contract Paper Group for a total of $60,303.60. Item 2.4 is the following books were presented for the 28 day period of examination on April 14th. So those are all listed. We have some IB World Lit books, um, more IB World Lit, reading books for grade six. <coughs> Items 2.5, bids have been accepted for commercial trash hauling service and recycle material hauling throughout the district. The administration recommends issuing a purchase order to the low and only bidder, Waste Management Services of Saginaw, at an annual cost of $36,224. Waste Management will be visiting all of our schools to look at our recycling programs and help to enhance the programs we already have in place to save money on waste removal. 2.6, administration recommends the renewal of the adult ed cooperative agreement between Bullet Creek School District Coleman Community Schools, Meridian Public Schools, and the Midland Public Schools for the 2014-15 school year. 2.7 is approval of the payment of the school system's bills for the month of 2014 as listed. Um, and 2.8 <coughs> is approval of uh, is requested to authorize payment for the following legal <coughs> bills. So I have a motion. I will move to adopt consent agenda items 2.1 through 2.8 as written in the agenda. And I would second that. All right. Moved by Member McFarland and supported by Member Singer. Any discussion? All right. We'll take a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Next up is request to address the board. I don't have any formal requests. Do you have any? Is there, a, but is there anybody out there who would like to address the board? If so, please come forward at this time. I mean, if you could state your name and address. Hi. Hi. I want to talk about the Great Lakes Bay Early College Program that we were told Midland Public Schools is no longer going to participate in. Um, I'm going to start with early in the year. My daughter Kaylee took the initiative to learn about and apply for a Great Lakes Bay Early College Program at SVSU this year. The program accepts high school students, um, completes their high school education, and may or may not lead to college credit by the completion of the I'd um, like to talk about a few benefits about the program and then add why such a program could help students like my daughter Kaylee. Kaylee is what I would call a kind of middle above average student, in which to say her, a her grades are A's. She gets an occasional C. Um, she often scores fairly high in the uh, standardized assessments, um, but not usually up near the top. I think her experience is pretty common. She works very hard for her grades. 
she doesn't really require any special services except for some extra help from some very dedicated teachers, and she does pretty good overall. But I think she is a little bit underserved. I think that she could do better. Um, I think she's in a large classroom and kind of expected to sit and toe the line in the classroom. She has a few chances to learn how to use technology in the classroom um, and how maybe some chances to creatively solve problems, but not a whole lot of independence in her education. So Kaylee was kind of feeling um, she wanted to explore other options. Um, we looked at AP and IB, and she is in um, an IB class currently and taking advanced classes currently. Um, we also looked at dual enrollment. It did not feel those were the places for her necessarily. She did hear about the opportunity of Gleebeck, the Great Lakes Bay program at SVSU. She spoke with other students who have gone through the program and are currently going through it. And she decided she wanted to talk to her counselor. So she made the appointment. She took the initiative. She spoke with her counselor um, in the very early spring, late winter time period. Um, she asked us if we would take her to the meeting at SBSU, which we did, and she decided with our help that she would apply for this program. So while she was doing that, of course, I was looking at what is going on with this program and discovered some benefits. They have small class sizes, support from counselors and mentors, the ability to have some directed studies, the opportunity to repeat fewer classes from the end of high school year of college. And most importantly, using technology in the classroom and some real independent thinking and learning that goes on. I was excited. I was kind of excited to see her excitement about this program and um, that she would have a good chance for her academic career. Then about two weeks ago, we ran into a friend who said, hey, did you know that Midland Public Schools is no longer going to participate in this program? And we said, well, we've talked to the counselor, we've talked to people at the school, and nobody told us that. So um, as soon as we heard this from our friend, who's really a mom from somebody who's currently in the program, uh, we talked to um, an administrator at the high school who confirmed, yes, Midland Public Schools is not going to participate in the program. Uh, we were told that due to poor communication with SVSU and the fact that the program was being marketed differently as expected, that Midland Public Schools would no longer allow its students to be admitted into that <coughs> consortium. So therefore, Kaylee would not be able to attend Gleetback in the fall. So her opportunity was really denied. And this was very upsetting to Kaylee, obviously, and to our family. We feel the excuses that were given from Midland Public Schools abandoning the program, lack of communication and marketing are a little bit senseless. I feel like if poor communication is, exists or existed, that it was the fault of both the SBSU and Berlin Public Schools. One example of that would be that we went through this whole application progress and not being aware that it wasn't even an option, and we had been talking with the people at Midland Public Schools and at the high school. Um, I feel like my child is being denied a little bit of personalization of her education. Um, and that traditional K through 12 learning is traditional. And traditional learning is not always the best for every student. And as a parent, I want my child to have the ability to succeed and to su succeed and do the best that she can. She, throughout this process, I feel learned to be a little bit of an advocate for herself. And, and to be able to um, learn how to apply and learn other options. Um, I also feel that the lack of community and lack of communication has fostered imbalance in the education, and unmet needs of students who really need the best educational support as possible as they head to the transition between a childhood and adulthood. And I feel like these students are being shortchanged by not having this as an option. The last reason we were given for no longer participating in Gleeback is obvious, which is financial. I don't feel this program is meant to be a war over funding of education. It's meant to serve students in the best way possible and meet their needs. So I feel like we need to ask ourselves, what is the best for each individual student?
And what is then the student's best interest? Well, choice. Choices can be given economically in a way that benefit all, benefits all the stakeholders in public education. We need cooperation. We definitely need communication. And we need to realize priorities, which are students. I would like Midland Public Schools to do what's right for Kaylee and for other students who desire a non-traditional avenue of education. Reconsider this decision, and please consider involvement in the GLEEBAC program. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. We'll look, we'll look into it and get back with you, OK? Thanks. All right. Is there anybody else who would like to address the board tonight? All right, moving on, um, I guess this is to you, Mike, for our Shining Star presentations. And we have two that we'd like to recognize this evening, two employees, as Don Wallace would want to come up. And as Don comes up, I'm going to read uh, a little bit about her background. Don Wallace is a dedicated, respected Midland Public Schools bus driver. She began her employment in the MPS Transportation Department as a substitute bus driver in 1993. One of Mrs. Wallace's supervisors remarked, Don is a safe driver. She is aware of where children are around and inside her bus. She is a friendly and helpful to her students. She is dependable, a team player, and a good employee. Yet another supervisor remarked, Don is a hardworking employee. She is always here and gets along well with others. Dawn also helps train our new bus drivers and does a great job. Dawn was nominated for the Shining Star by an MPF's colleague. Among his comments, the staff member wrote, Dawn is the employee that everyone should have. Her attendance is excellent and is always looking out for the safety of her fellow bus drivers and students. She goes above and beyond to help anyone in need and finds a way to help with other employees and students' families. Congratulations, Dawn, on being named the May 2014 MPS Shining Star employee. Thank you. Our second um, employee we'd like to rec recognize today is Keith Seibert. Mr. Keith Seibert began his career with Midland Public Schools in 1998 as a physical education teacher in grades 6, 7, and 8 at Northeast Middle School. Before coming to MPS, Keith was an elementary PE teacher in Grayling. In addition to his PE teaching duties, Keith has been track coach at both Midland High School and Northeast Middle School, as well as swimming coach at Northeast. Keith graduated from Saginaw Valley State University in 1995 with a Bachelor of Science degree. In 2003, Keith earned his master's degree in school administration from Central Michigan University. One of Mr. Seibert's supervisors remarked, Mr. Seibert continues to be an instructional leader in our building. His willingness to help out, his positive spirit are inspirational and motivating. He has a good sense of humor and relates well to students and other staff. Mr. Seibert is an exceptional educator on all levels. Yet another supervisor stated, Keith is one of the most quality teachers that I've ever had the chance to work with. He is a big part of what makes Northeast the great school it is. He is a bright, kind, and upbeat. His dedication to students is amazing. Keith Seibert is an individual that gives teaching a good name. The influence he has on children is life-altering. Keith was nominated for the Shining Star Award by an MPS colleague. This person wrote, I am nominating Keith because I feel that he does a great job of making kids feel important, not only in his class, but around the school as well. He makes a great effort in getting to know the kids he has in his class and around the school by being in out in the hallways, in between class, and during his prep. I've looked up Keith's methods for teaching for many years, and he was a great role model for me when I stood and taught. Keith goes above and beyond by working with kids that need the extra help and staying after when kids need his help. He has always has his door open if students need to talk to him. His attitude is always chipper and friendly. He jokes a lot with kids, which I which makes the kids feel comfortable and makes the less athletic kids in physical education feel like they are part of the team and are involved. Congratulations to Keith Seibert on being the May 2014 MPS Shining Star employee. Great job, Keith. Thank, Thank you. you.
All right, congratulations to Don and Keith. Moving on, we have a presentation from the fifth grade music programs. We'll have uh, Bridget Hockmeyer, Tracy Renfro, get us started. Yes, no? Did I throw that off? We can be, we're gonna let our music teacher do it. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Barbara Jacques and I'm the music teacher at Plymouth Elementary School and I'm so thankful that you invited us to come and sing for you tonight. We are going to start now, enjoy. And you will notice that we are going to invite you to join us for a piece in a little bit.
nice job. Thank you all very much. That was beautiful. What? My kid's doing that. Okay, I know that I was learned it. that was very complex. You weren't. It was both hands. I was trying to see if I couldn't have gotten them both going. <laughs> Thank you all very much nice for job. coming Thank tonight. You, you all are so nice. I love your songs. <laughs> You're coming tonight, guys. Bye. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. They don't even get it to hear us praise them. I know. <laughs> That's what I did. Yeah, they would stay around to talk to, but. Oh, yeah. Apparently, they've been given too much homework tonight, maybe. Yeah. Yes, I've, I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> there were some heavy backpacks. <laughs> well, good evening, everyone. My name is Roger Stevens. And uh, I am headed for the conclusion of my 21st year as an employee of Midland Public Schools. And uh, when I was hired, I was uh, given the plum assignments of doing elementary band at Chestnut Hill and actually Plymouth Elementary, as well as Northeast Middle School, at the time Northeast Intermediate. When the Northeast program grew too big, uh, I had to give up Plymouth. But I've remained at Chestnut Hill for all 21 years, and it's been a treat. One of the things that, uh, that I want to remark on is that consistency. And in fact, you might be surprised to know that all three of the fifth grade teachers at Chestnut Hill, when I was hired 21 years ago, are still there. And one of them has been assigned now to fourth grade. But the opportunity to work with the same people, develop the camaraderie, <coughs> the understanding of how each program works and interfaces has really been a benefit to our program. Uh, tonight, I'd like to talk about and focus on the uh, elementary instrumental program. Uh, a lot of times when you talk to the public, as, as you have an opportunity to do frequently, uh, people will remark about the marching bands. They were at the Dow High and Midland High football games. They were amazed at the 400 students on the football field. They may have attended a, a concert where our orchestras were combined, our high school orchestras. They may have attended a concert where our choral ensembles from the high schools were combined. You can travel around the state and you can find many schools that have a good band, many schools that have a good orchestra, many schools that have fine vocal music programs. You'll find somewhat fewer that have two out of those three. When you get to all three programs and all operating at a very high level, you'll find only a few. And Midland should be very proud that they're one of them. However, the, uh, the fact is those groups don't happen in a vacuum. They don't happen without a great deal of support and a great feeding of the roots. And you just saw one great example of the beginnings of the programs that ultimately culminate with the ones that draw so much positive public attention. There's an amusing myth for some of those of us who teach music, that we just walk into the room, wave our arms, and music happens. Well, that's not true. Um, you know, a beautiful plant doesn't grow and blossom without healthy roots. And your professional music education staff at the elementary level includes Mrs. Darla Iaquinta, Mrs. Tracy Kemsel, Mrs. Jan Wolner, Mrs. Barbara Jacques, Mrs. Tina DeLong, and Mrs. Sarah Haskett. Now I'd like to do a little overview of the elementary general curriculum. Uh, this curriculum has been uh, in place for a, a number of years and we're based on the content standards and benchmarks uh, talked about nationwide. These content standards talk about singing, performing, improvising, reading and notating music, listening, describing, and evaluating performances, and understanding the relationships between music, the other arts, and the tie that music has to history and the culture of each society. Now, we hear an awful lot of talk about 21st century skills. We want our students to graduate with them. What are they? Well, if you've performed on the stage in front of an audience, think about your level of confidence when you make that sales presentation. Or how you will understand one culture versus another when you have to travel internationally. Now the meeting time for uh, 
elementary music is only once a week, and, and that's very slim. So you know that your, your faculty is doing a great job with what they're teaching and getting the students to get through all this. As we focus on the fourth grade curriculum, we note that uh, developmentally appropriate steps have been taken, and they're moving forward through uh, these benchmarks that we talked about. And in fact, there are also special education needs and areas of developmental health. For instance, coordinative skills, auditory and listening skills coupled with movement, speech, other areas of learning such as reading, body awareness, and language. And last but not least, especially for those special needs learners, a sense of achievement, enjoyment, group participation. Now at this time, we have a PowerPoint of our fourth grade concert. Last month, uh, we had a fourth grade music celebration concert. Mrs. Parrots was kind enough to provide a <coughs> PowerPoint for us. One of the most exciting events of the MPS music program each spring is the fourth grade music celebration concert. Preparation for this concert begins several weeks in advance for the fourth grade students as they learn a song in the Mendi language from the movie Amistad, Dry Your Tears, Africa. Students are bused to the Midland Center for the Arts courtesy of the Midland Symphony League Educational Outreach Program, an example of a partnership with a community resource that many may not know about. The fourth grade students are treated to hearing some of the most talented musicians of our schools, the Midland and Dow High School Symphony Orchestras, the MHS Meister Singers, Dow High Chorus, and the Midland Center Stage Youth Honors Choirs. After singing our national anthem, the students have the opportunity to hear the special sound quality of each of the string, woodwind, brass, and percussion instruments. The vocal students are up next as they demonstrate the unique sound of soprano, alto, tenor, and bass. Students thoroughly enjoy hearing the full high school choirs create the rainstorm with the tune Africa by Toto, and this year, the immensely popular highlights from Frozen. The instrumentalists engage in a fascinating musical competition called the Orchestra Games. The highlight of the concert is Dry Your Tears Africa, when all of the fourth graders, the choirs, and the orchestras perform together. I'd like to share a few of the comments that the students provided. The fourth graders were asked to do some writing when they returned to their schools. Mm -hmm. And here's just a couple of uh, excerpts from Woodcrest. Dear orchestra, I really enjoyed your performance. The instrument that I liked the most were the cymbals. I love the noise the cymbals make. Thank you for playing music. I'm sure that's going to be one very happy parent. <laughs> Dear orchestra, I had such a good time at your concert. It was awesome. At the concert, I learned a lot about the different notes, such as high, low, loud, and soft notes. I don't play an instrument, but next year in fifth grade, I am planning on playing something. I am thinking about playing the trumpet or clarinet, but I really don't know yet. But thank you so much for your performance. I loved it. And then from uh, Plymouth. They were provided with some prompts. When I think of all the instruments, I like these best. And this person said they are flute, bass, and violin, because I love to hear the calm music of those beautiful instruments. Um, they said, it just brings happiness. It was so awesome, it brought giggles to me. <laughs> 
So it's a great opportunity for them to learn about things. And what happens then with that transition is that through the fourth grade curriculum and through this opportunity with this concert, the students now will enter fifth grade with some knowledge of the instruments. And so when the band and orchestra teacher go into that school at the beginning of the fifth grade school year and they make their presentation about beginning band and beginning orchestra, the students will have some clues about what kinds of things they like, what kind of the sounds they want to explore, and so forth. I remember a few years ago I had a, a young man come up to me after my presentation at Chestnut Hill and he said, well, I'd really like to join a band or maybe orchestra, but I don't play an instrument. And I looked at him and I said, you're exactly the person we're looking for. <laughs> you know, we, we take the students from nothing. They're just coming to us with a desire to learn, and that's what the staff does. Having this background provided by the elementary music faculty, we see a, rec a quicker assimilation of note names. Certainly, literacy is a, is a huge part of our program. Uh, we see a great confidence in the counting of rhythms. Uh, I will use with my fifth graders the opportunity, because I'm at Chestnut Hill and I, I work with uh, Mrs. Iaquinta, I'll be able to say to the students, now let's go back to Mrs. Iaquinta's room. How would you say that rhythm in her room? And they relate to that immediately. And then I, I can take it from there and take them from something they know into something that would be new to them in a, in a new system of counting. Even in middle school, I'll sometimes say, let's get in a time machine and go back to Mrs. Wolner's classroom or Mrs. Jacques' classroom or whatever, and how would you have done it there? So when you're at home, you now have a problem-solving strategy, even if you're confused a little bit by what we're doing here. You can go back to something uh, uh, that you are uh, familiar with and work towards the new stuff. In conclusion, I just want you to think about the success at the top of our program is a direct reflection of the excellence of our music staff at the beginning levels and the support we have received in the past. Our staff has high expectations of themselves as well as for their students. You will see many of us performing with various community groups such as Midland Symphony, Midland Community Orchestra, Midland Concert Band, Chemical City Band, Good Company, Resonators Percussion Ensemble, and Camerata Singers as well as in many area churches. Being so involved in actively making music ourselves leads us to place a high value on each student and each minute we have with those students, as well as every resource we can use. Nice job. Really nice job. Sounded wonderful. Wonderful. I don't know if anyone has comments, if they're going to come. How much did we have to pay for the tickets tonight? I don't know. <laughs> this is wonderful to actually see two shows. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I, I went to the fourth grade musical event, but it was quite the event, pretty powerful. Oh, but yeah. It sounded a lot better than it did on the screen there. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All right. Does anyone have any comments, or shall we go on? 
I think it's great how we have the fourth and fifth grade programs to feed the high school programs, mm -hmm. and you do, you, you're exactly right. You have to start at the beginning and to have these opportunities here at Midland Public Schools makes it uh, a great district to be a part of, something to be proud of. I think Mr. Stevens touched on the fact that it's amazing what they can do, and Ms. Tom's too, in seven months. Students that have never been exposed to music, and you go to those end of the year concerts, and uh, it says a lot about what our, our staff, parents, and students do. So thank Especially you for coming. Especially little time mm -hmm. during the week. Yeah, right. I thought it was neat how Barbara Jockin with the fifth graders uh, not only worked on their musical talents, but also uh, chose pieces that built their self-esteem and built up who they were and values and beliefs. And I thought that was a really neat idea. Mm -hmm. Kind of brings in the PYP learning. Yeah, I think yep. it's great how we have so many, just she was saying, 23 kids in the orchestra are 21, and I know it was that way when my children were going through too. It's wonderful that not only do we feed a band program, but an orchestra program and all the choir programs. It's wonderful that we offer those options. Okay. All right. Well, thanks to them again. <laughs> oh, they left before we could. Well, they'll watch on TV, I'm sure. Yes, yes, and for it's anyone really out there, and even the parents <laughs> left to remind them that we do re-televise these, so if anyone would like to watch them again, please go online and or on to TV and watch them. All right, next up, do you want to introduce yep. our next? We're going to turn from the arts to budgets, and we're going <laughs> to turn it over to John Searles and the Midland County Educational Service Agency and their budget, which is perfect timing walking in, John. Change, big time. <laughs> yes. You only hear them play, too. And I'll just remind everyone that this presentation can be watched again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> also, that's the point where the, the, the red button goes click. <laughs> but you will explain it so well the first time there will be no need, right? My name is John Searles, and I'm the superintendent of Midland County ESA. I'd like to introduce Mark Oriel. Mark joined us in October as our, our chief financial officer and has been doing a great job of helping us to really look at our budget and, and get that work in line. So together, we're going to tag team this presentation tonight, and I'm going to let, let Mark start off. All right. What I want to do is kind of just give a broad overview of uh, our funds and so forth for the charge. Uh, at the ESA, we have uh, five different funds. We have our general operating fund. We have our bigger special education fund. We have our capital projects fund, which was for our Longview Early Childhood Center, uh, which will be done with that one this year. We have our enterprise fund, which is the Unquinap Cyber Network Fund. And this year, we actually started up a food service fund because we are having some students that are actually selling food uh, from our post-secondary students and so forth, so we had that as a new fund. For our actual budget, uh, we have a list of assumptions of everything that we had to assume for next year, because obviously not everything is known at this point. Uh, so we took a very conservative approach. Uh, our, for our state aid, we assumed that the foundation amount was going to be flat and also the STE was going to be flat, even though it's probably most likely we'll have a slight increase in STE. Our Section 81 money, which is money that we get at ISD, uh, that amount is going to be the same as 13 14. Our federal revenues, uh, we're estimating to be down about 5%, and that's uh, probably because of sequestration and so forth. We took a conservative 5%. We're roughly at about $3 million that we get in federal revenues, so it's about $150,000 decrease. Hopefully we uh, don't have that much of a decrease. Property taxes, uh, tax value for the whole county as a whole was up 0.5% or half percent. So we'll get a little more revenue there. And of course, that does tie in with the enhancement millage, which is just a little bit under $5 million for the county as a whole, for which uh, the public, of course, gets their applicable share. So you should see also you know, a half percent increase in enhancement millage. Our GSRP consortium is in the, the general fund, and it's for Great Start Readiness Program. It's a 
multi-county consortium that we have. So it's very large for us. It's, uh, we're projecting next year to be about $11 million in this consortium. So we do have a lot of additional revenues ex associated expenses with that in our general fund. The Medicaid funds uh, for next year, 14-15, should be similar to the 13-14 year, which is current year. Uh, but the 13-14 year did see a very large increase compared to the prior years. So we did receive some additional funds in 13-14. Going into some more of the expense assumptions for the budget, our, our salaries, uh, the teachers are eligible for a slight off schedule stipend uh, that is dependent on, on their evaluation. So some of them may get it, some may not. Our paraprofessional ranks, uh, overall, they, there are some that are eligible for some. It's uh, probably not going to be a very major increase because I don't think very many of them will actually will meet their specifications for that base. Uh, as of right now, our current insurance carrier has told us uh, our insurance rate should go up 22%. Uh, however, we do have caps in place and co-pay premium sharing for our employees, which will probably be only make the increase by maybe 6 or 7% at the most. Uh, we do currently have another bid out uh, for, I think, what, July 1st time frame that we may get actually lower rates, so we'll wait and see on that. The retirement rate uh, this year uh, with the 147C state funds were pretty much capped at a certain dollar amount or percentage rate. So any additional increase in the retirement rate is offset by the 147C state fund. So the retirement rate really has no effect on our increased cost next year. You can see the, the list of things here are some of the various areas in the general fund that we provide services in. And as I move through, you're, you're very familiar with all of these various areas in terms of ways that we provide support. I, I wanted to touch on just a few areas that I think are increasingly important as we move through these times of smaller budgets. It's really important, I believe, that we continue to develop consortium with other ISDs so that we can leverage resources as our funds continually to decrease. So as we bring more people into consortium, we are able to provide higher quality service at a lower cost. And some of these areas have been areas of focus for us over the last few years. Technology services has been a great way for us to save money at the ESA and then offer the opportunity for locals to take advantage of the services that we provide. So Midland ESA along with Saginaw ISD and just recently the Bay Area ISD have come together to provide service in the area of technology not only for ourselves, but for locals that might be interested. Next, the, as Mark spoke about, the Early Childhood Consortium, the GSRP, is something that is around an $11 million in and out for us. But if you look at it as a service that we're providing, it is increasing quality, not only here in Midland County for four-year-olds in preschool, but across this region. Increasing quality of preschool education across the region is a win for all of us because kids are more and more mobile all the time. So we want to make sure that everyone's getting that great start. Next, I wanted to mention Pupil Accounting. Pupil Accounting is another consortium across five ISDs which helps us to lower costs and provide the required accounting services at the ISD level. And finally, instructional services. Our instruction has increased in terms of the, the number of ISDs. Now, last year I told you about the th second year, the third year, of how we had three ISDs working together, Bay Aranac, uh, Midland, and Saginaw. We are increasing that by a fourth and possibly a fifth in this year so that we have more and more ISDs working together, leveraging resources and our expertise over a wider region. So again, more people collaborating in order to provide higher quality service to the local districts at a lower cost. And those are good things. I'd also like to talk a bit about special education because it's certainly on all of our minds, right? In, in terms of our paraeducator contract that Mark mentioned, we have a new contract when the first year of a three-year agreement which works to increase quality and over time lower costs. So you think about paraeducators, we need to make sure that those in the classroom are working at the highest possible level, but also 
working as a team and increasing that overall value add to the classroom, right? So the way that we can do that is by increasing training, working better as a team. And one of the ways that we chose to do that, not only from the professional development aspect, but also trying to attract and retrain, ret attract and retain individuals who have that desire to really work hard to be in those classrooms. So we did that by increasing the pay slightly and then offering health benefits. At a time when everyone's trying to get away from health benefits, we believe that over time, it will actually be more cost effective in terms of attraction and retention to increase wages and to offer the minimum standard, according to the Affordable Care Act, of what health care must, must be in terms of the, all the, the definitions. What we project is over that three year period, while the first year is actually an increase in cost, the second and the third years show, we project around $100,000 or so in savings. Okay, so slight increase the first year, around $30,000, and then multiple years of savings. Because of the increased quality, we're able to reduce the numbers in each classroom. So that's something that we're very much committed to, and the local superintendents and I, are, are we have plans to work together to, to try to, to increase quality and continue to lower cost. In terms of the post-secondary population, you heard me talk last year about that number continuing to increase because there's more and more kids that are 18 or older that can't graduate from high school because of the, the graduation requirements. That means that there are more and more kids that are eligible to stay in special education programs. What we want to be able to do is to make sure that those programs are high quality and that they can earn skills that are requisite for moving into the community and holding jobs where they can contribute to society and feel like they are um, actual members of our community. So some of the, the programs that we've worked on, uh, first you see programs move to the Southern site. Well, we had programs across the county, actually three different programs and three different sites where we consolidated those into our Sugnet site. And so we've, we're saving money on the rent. We did a little bit of renovations to make sure that we have space that is adequate for kids and for the programming that we offer. For example, we have um, a, a new apartment. We created like an apartment type of living space so that kids can practice living on their own, practice doing dishes, um, ironing their clothes, doing laundry and such. We also added what we call the hub, which is kind of uh, our version of Starbucks. And that place is self-sufficient. People are coming in off the street. And you're certainly welcome to come in anytime, you know, 8 to 4, and have a coffee or snack. We're even having lunches there now. That is giving kids the opportunity to learn skills in the food service area and then be able to exit our programming and hold real jobs. The third thing that I would like to mention is here's the hub and the Poolside Cafe. The Poolside Cafe is in cooperation with the community center. And that provides us the opportunity to have a cafe environment where kids are learning to provide food service. So if you get a chance, you haven't been to the Poolside Cafe, stop over for lunch. The pizza is amazing. <laughs> it will remind you of sitting in a cafe in Rome. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, the Bicycle Recycle is a cooperation between this club, Bicycle Recycle, and the ESA. They um, collect bicycles from all over the county and provide them at no cost to kids with low, kids of low income or special needs. And it's a great opportunity for kids in our programs to work with their hands to learn another skill, which they could then go out in one of our three bike shops in town and, and actually earn a living. So it's a really cool program. I wanted to also mention some of the other work that I've been trying to, to do in bringing people together. We're calling ourselves the Disability Coalition, but really it's a group of people from the Disability Network, from the Reese Endeavor, um, that's our mayor, Community Mental Health and the Arnold Center. People coming together to talk about what we have in common and what we do separately. So for example, we all have job developers. We wonder, is there a way for us to bring our job developers together and work cooperatively instead of all coming in and developing our own work kind of in silos? We think that that's one example of where we can, just by sitting together and talking, we can, over time, save costs and also do a better job at serving the population. All right, I've got the <laughs> wanted to mention Longview. 
last year at this time, I talked to you about the Longview project, how you sold us that beautiful facility, and how we've invested, invested about $2.6 million, all raised through community grants and fundraising efforts. That place, is, if you haven't had an opportunity to see it, it's amazing. It's a beautiful facility, and kids and families are all there receiving the services that they need in a single facility. It's an amazing concept and one that is working very well, serving kids from Midland Public. In terms of career and technical education, we've brought on Don Johnson to help work with our uh, career and technical education programs. And we have a couple new things. We have a con summer construction camp in cooperation with the Associated Biz Builders and Contractors and with the Greater Michigan Construction Academy. And we are very happy that we're offering a new uh, program in the fall. And that program will offer kids the opportunity to learn the construction trade. So they'll, in the first semester, they'll have a survey of 10 different uh, opportunities. And in the second semester, they'll choose one of four uh, high demand jobs to pursue. Jobs like HVAC, like plumbing, like welding, and like drywalling. In those different areas, we're, we're working directly with the contractors to see what are the most four top hiring jobs at any one time, and we can become very nimble. So we might offer these four this year and change next year to a different four based on what the market is, is driving. It's a great concept because in schools, we don't tend to be as nimble as we ought to be to respond to market values. And this program, I think, will, will do that. So we're excited about that. Back to Mark. Okay, now what I want to do is kind of give a comparative uh, summary of uh, the fund balances and revenue expenses of our two funds, the general fund and the special ed funds. For the general fund, uh, we are, like I had mentioned, our, because of the GSRP consortium, this year, the middle bar, uh, we jumped up quite a bit, I think like about $9 million is that amount, but next year we expect about $11 million. So it's going to increase our total revenue is almost to about $20 million in our in our general fund, where the expenses are going to pretty much follow that, because with the consortium, what we do is we receive the money and we pass it out to other local, so revenue and expenses pretty much are the same. On the uh, right over there, and I have a little bit better graph later on, but we can see the fund balance in our general fund. Uh, this year is going down quite a bit, because we did have several one-time expenditures that in some transfers that we had to make to cover some expenses, so it is going to go down a little bit. Next year, I think we're only budgeted to be about 100000 in the hole in our general fund, for which uh, if we you know, cut back on some things, we'll probably break even on that. <coughs> in the special education fund, uh, for this year, uh, in the middle again, the revenues are up, and the primary reason for that is we did receive a lot of Medicaid money, over $3 million. Uh, a lot of that is both the current year amounts went up, but we also have settlements from prior years, going back to 08, 09. So we got a lot of extra money for each of those years. So our revenue this year is up quite a bit because of that. As you can see for next year, we're actually scheduled to go down because the Medicaid will probably be about $1.2 million. And the expenses, uh, both of the years are, are higher than what they were in the previous year. So overall, then our fund balance, you can see actually it goes up this year. But it's primarily because we do have, I think, 666,000 of expected settlement funds that are going to come in that we're going to distribute actually next year. So the fund balance will go up this year. So then when we distribute it next year, we'll actually go down lower than what we were at the end of last year. So it's just kind of a little bit up and down uh, in the fund balance amount. I think we're scheduled to be about a million dollars in the hole uh, next year in the special ed fund. taking a look at over the last couple of couple three years actually what that fund equity in special ed in the special ed account should be. So the special ed plan says one number and we've been carrying a different number and what we've tried to do is to be uh, transparent in terms of talking about what should that number be? What's that ideal number? We pretty much through conversation not only internally but with the local superintendents arrived at a number of 13 that 13% should be about the right number to hold in fund equity. Because we have to be cognizant of the fact that as programs, 
ebb and flow. Sometimes we have to open a program, and the typical cost of opening a program is somewhere between $100,000 and $150,000, and could be more depending on the specializations that are required. So in order to be responsible, I think that somewhere around that 13% is our target number. So we've been moving that number down over the past couple of years, and we're getting closer to the 13. Uh, this kind of gives a little bit better of a graphic of uh, the come down percentages. As you see the general fund, I think we were at 17% at the end of last year, and we're actually projecting to be close to 6% at the end of the 14 15 year, but we should stabilize at that point. Special education fund, I believe, the exact amount was 22.8% last year at the end of the year. Like I say, it'll, it'll jump up to 24.7, but then it'll go down to actually 18% in 14 15. So we are starting to go down a little bit towards the 13% that uh, John mentioned. And this is the uh, next couple slides is nothing more than a breakdown of our revenues and expenses in both the general and the special ed funds. To kind of give you a better idea of what's in there. In our general fund, the property taxes, uh, five million of that is the enhancement millage. The other 630,000 is our operating money that we get uh, other local sources is our early childhood program that we have. I believe we receive about $700,000 there. That's the biggest part of that amount. Uh, the state sources is our GSRP consortium. As you see that amount is close to $12 million. Federal sources, we receive the Perkins grant, which we uh, run through our general fund. And our inter-district sources and others is the billings we may charge off like technology services or so forth to other districts. And there's a lot of other small things that go in there. With our total revenue in the general fund is nineteen million four hundred eight thousand dollars. On the expenditure side, uh, we have very little in instruction. There's just five hundred dollars there, so the majority of ours is uh, support services. Uh, community services would be the early childhood program. Uh, we have a little bit of capital outlay plan, and then you see the two biggest expenditures on our books are really just nothing more than pass-throughs. Enhancement millage we receive, we pass out to the locals. There's the $5 million there. And the transfers to other districts is the GSRP money for which we receive in and gets passed out. So really 15 million of our $19.6 million budget is just nothing more than us passing money through. And special education, uh, the property taxes, that is basically the PA18 revenue that we receive in. Other local sources, that's the Medicaid money. Majority of that is 1.2 million. Our state sources come from our FTE count times the foundation amount. Uh, federal sources, uh, about three million of that is the IDEA special education grant. There's some other smaller grants that we would get in there. And the inter-district sources is the tuition that we charge locals for the special ed services that we provide. So there's roughly 13 million 700,000 there. And then on the special education expenditures, uh, the instruction is the in-classroom in expenditures for our teachers. Our support services would be the OT, PT services, social worker, etc. cetera. Uh, we do have some capital outlay plan for some of the classrooms. And the transfers to others is nothing more than the transfers that we give back out to the locals for the remaining amount of the P18 formula. We have both tuition coming in that you pay us, and then we also distribute money going back out. That's what's included in that transfer to others. Total expenditures there is fourteen million seven hundred seventy-three thousand, for which, like I said, roughly about a million dollars will be going in the hole next year at fourteen fifteen, for which six hundred sixty-six thousand was because of the Medicaid transfers. So we kind of explain why we're going in the hole. That is the last slide there. At that point, I guess is there any questions on any of the information I gave or any? Particular questions you may have in regards to the yourselves, that can be answered right. Yeah, yeah, just a comment with uh, Mr. Searles, like you were saying about the fund balance. I mean, you have a fair amount of instruction with your line of business that has to occur during the summer, right? I mean, there's there's sessions that go on, especially for some of the younger for home visits. Well, that's extended school year, right? It, right. So you know, you have. I, I think certainly that's that's understandable. You know, having a fund balance like that to to carry the bills through the summer, I think that that's that sounds reasonable. And just curious with looking at the future for Medicaid payments, 
I know that's a bit of a wild card from the FFO, from our financial committee. Um, do, you, do you think that the predictability that's gonna go up or down or just remain a wild card as far as going forward to 14, 15? We expect that it's going to remain fairly stable. We think that we have, in, in Midland County, all of our districts are doing an extremely amazing job of doing the, the billing for Medicaid. And in fact, we're probably doing one of the best in anywhere in the state. And so we have a very high expectation. But um, we think that we're doing about as good as we possibly can. So we expect that it's going to remain fairly stable. Okay. So in the future budget, um, when payments come in, do you think they're going to be a little higher? Or you think it'd be more? Because we had the extra that came in this time for the back years. It was more due to the back years. There, there's always that opportunity for adjustments because you're kind of like working with a year behind. Okay. The, um, the interesting thing about the, the 09, 10 year, the 08, 09, and 09, 10 mm -hmm. was that there was like a, the perfect storm of problems that happened. I think I may have spoken about this a bit last year, but there was a software conversion and in the midst of the software conversion at the state level, they lost the data. And so we had to resubmit the data and okay. it took nearly three years to, to work out the issue with them, and that we hope won't ever happen again. Because that was ridiculous, right? Mm -hmm. But um, you know, hopefully, as as time goes on, this will kind of stabilize a bit. But it's good to, to see that you know with Mark's work um, that there are the additional uh, reimbursements that are coming in. Okay. So it's a good question. Yeah. Some of some of this kind of crystal ball work, but um, yeah, no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And, and then just one more, if I may, the, uh, is the, what's the main factor behind the increase in the rates? It's not really the utilization, like you're having, you know, workers you have more rates of, of, uh, uh, of, you know, filing claims, that type of thing. So what's the reason for the Actually, increase? I, th I think it is that. I think that. Well, okay, so it's the utilization, maybe the overall pay amount of the budget towards. Well, I think it's, it's the fact that we are providing services that are Medicaid eligible. Right? Okay. And then not just us, everyone. Okay. across the, the district, and I think that we're keeping good tabs on who is doing the reimbursements and when. I think it's in terms of personnel. Payment. In terms of personnel, did your rates go up? I mean, Are you talking about their insurance rates? Yeah, that's what I was thinking Medicaid? about, like the insurance rates like, oh, okay. for the okay. personnel. Well, I, I was think still talking about Medicaid. Yeah, oh, sorry, I was uh, going on <laughs> to something else, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. talking yeah. about Medicaid. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's no. been a thorn in your side, I know. Yeah. So, um, the issue with the health care rates yes. is yeah, that's that right. we, over the past three years, have had almost no increase. In fact, the last two years, we've actually reduced our insurance costs. And we've done that by changing our deductible rates. Mm -hmm. We have a group that's experience rated, so we have been able to reimburse the deductibles. And we've taken a, a $10,000 um, family deductible, mm -hmm. so five and 10, and then backfilled that. But our the backfilling, the reimbursement of that, of that high deductible has been very cost effective. While we were exposed to, uh, let's say, a half a million dollars, the actual mm -hmm. amount that we are, are paying for the reimbursement or for that um, is, is somewhere around eighty to $90,000 over the past three years. So we felt that it would be in our best interest to increase that deductible. And increasing the deductible has allowed us to keep those costs at bay. So we're all familiar with the hard cap. We're actually below the hard cap, and we have uh, in our contract the agreement to share increases. So any increase is shared 50% with those employees covered and 50% with the administration. So both of us, we have the incentive to make sure that we're trying to bring down those costs. And again, with a 22% increase, and the 22% is a lot, but it's also due to a lot of those, um, what do you call them, all of those codes like, can you say some of those? I don't know, for the Medicaid, or for, um, that are related to the Affordable Care Act? Sure, the requirements. Um, those requirements and the taxes, and they're for research, and all of those things. I don't have them all memorized yet, but all of those contribute significantly to the amount that, this, that we see in this jump. And again, worst case, 22% mitigated um, half and half, right? And we're, we're fairly confident that we'll be able to find lower rates. We're already seeing that there are some other options. And when you have the opportunity to share those costs, you know, half of the 22 going to the to most of our employees, there is definitely the motivation to say, oh yeah, let's look at this other plan. It might be more cost effective. 
I'm talking about. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, I, was, I was actually going to ask on that. So do you see that, though, the 22% as being like a one-time thing because of the factors you said? Or wow. is it something you're going to have to keep an eye on that I don't know if you have any indication of that? Well, it's one of those things that we're all keeping an eye on, yeah. right? Because we just it seems like that is the one area that we just can't control, although we're doing our best to do that, right? We're all trying to do wellness activities. We're looking at new plans. I mean, we're, used to be we quoted insurance you know, every three years. Now we do it every year mm -hmm. to see that make sure that the rates that we're getting are the best, more flexible and changing from one plan to another. All of those factors have to be there part of the mix this now because we don't know exactly what those rates are going to look like from year to year. 22% seems like a lot, right? But I've also heard others higher than that. So we definitely going to always keep our eye on that ball, just like you are. And what about you had said, I think it was in your very first slide, about your FTE being flat. Is that the number of students that you're supporting? Uh, FTE is both in terms of students, okay. really flat, and in terms of the number of employees. Really flat. Okay, because then you had said another point that there are more students in the 18 and older that you're starting to service. Does that mean you're yeah, seeing a drop off of the okay? Age. So it's a shift. It's not. It is a an shift. Increase. But coming down the pike are a lot of, a lot more kids with special needs, um, especially in the the autism population. We're seeing that continue to spike, just like we see nationally. So that's something that we need to be aware of. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Well, again, we appreciate the opportunity to come in and talk with you every year. I didn't want to mention Kevin High is here, our board president. And I appreciate him being here as well. So thanks again for the time and for this opportunity. All right, thank, you very thank you. Much. Thank you. Just to say one thing is that uh, I know Linda's retiring this year, so I just wanted to publicly say it's, uh, I think I know her about 11 years old. You guys are going to be missing a big part of uh, financial knowledge, that's for sure. So. We know that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Moving on. Do you want to announce this one, Mike? Sure. Uh, we get Kathy Parrott going to come up and talk about the Looking Sharp campaign, which all of you are familiar with. I think Kathy's somewhere behind the screen coming up. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Kathy Parrott, and it's my pleasure and privilege to teach band and orchestra at Midland High School and for the last four years serve as lead teacher for the district for music. And what I have, this is my speech. <laughs> I like it. Um, I have no speech tonight, just an update. And um, be, do I get the, ah, see, what, and then it's, okay. There we go. Um, give a little back. Um, as you may remember, the tuning up uh, fund that was started was to buy instruments and equipment that wasn't covered in the sinking fund who, that provided us our new facilities and renovated facilities in both high schools for music. That fund gave us a total of 49959.83. Our fund total, which was used to buy instruments, as you can see, some of the violas that we ha were able to purchase, uh, Midland High uh, lockers, which we had not had lockers before this time, stands and chairs for our new rooms. Back. The larger instruments that needed to be replaced, some of them as much as 30 years old, woodwinds and, and uh, strings were able to support some of the larger ones that students typically would not be able to afford to buy. Direction going. That led to, we need new uniforms. But that particular fund was specified to only pay for equipment. So we needed a fund that could pay for uniforms. We went to the Midland Foundation and said, can we create another fund, a partnership with Midland Public Schools, and use the, looking, uh, the tuning up as a template for looking sharp. And as you can see, we have, really did have a need. We didn't need to have those kinds of wardrobe malfunctions on the marching field. <laughs> and our choir dresses as well were ripping at the seams and being uh, patched up with duct tape and safety pins. So we really did have this deep need. 
Uh, this is the first purchase with, with the funds that we have. The Dow Choir was able to outfit their choir with new dresses and new tuxes and ties and sashes. Um, that these were purchased in um, December. Currently, we are so very fortunate because we have good music programs, but we have the support of the community to help fund those programs. So many schools have had to cut their programs or, or uh, eliminate, choose between orchestra, band, and choir, eliminate one of those. But in Midland, we've got the tremendous community support so that we can keep going. As you can see, the tremendous racist, uh, support that we've had from uh, Stro Stafford, Gert Stafford, the Midland 100, and the huge com contribution by the community, over $61,000 from individuals and the music parents, which speaks uh, volumes about the support of the overall community. Held at the uh, Midland Area Community Foundation right now, we have uh, over $125,000. And with the, I'm sure you all know about the wonderful support of the Herbert H. and Grace A. Dow Foundation that gave us $75,000, which is in a restricted fund to spend for, for new uniforms. So total to date raised is two th over 200,000. We have an additional $2,000 now from uh, Ford Lincoln. Uh, you may have seen we ran a little um, fundraiser. If you came in and tried a new car out, took it for a test drive, they gave $20 for each person that came in to test drive those. And it was a horrible rainy Saturday. They put up a tent for us and they said, this has been great for them, great for us, over $2,000 contribution and they wanna do it again for us next year. Okay, so so far the update is um, Dow High Choir, 87 outfits. HH Dow, 70. Uh, Midland High Marching Band, we, we had um, 52 uniforms, replacing the worst of those, and new drum major uniforms, which we very badly needed. Our total expenditures to date are 70,000. We have an available fund balance of 132,000, and we still need to meet our goal 47408 and we're going strong with that. We still need to purchase the Dow Orchestra con um, concert band and orchestra uniforms and at Midland High choir and orchestra and we just about got those selected and a concert band uniform. So that's that's where we are right now. And we do want to say a big thank you to the Midland Area Community Foundation for housing those funds for us so that people could get tax receipts for making their contributions. And they have also printed our donation cards and given us envelopes and tremendous support. Anybody have any questions? So just thank you. Thank you for helping out with organizing. And it's My great. pleasure. I, uh, I had a chance to go to um, the holiday performance at Central Middle School for the Christmas performance and that was the first picture you showed of, a, of the black gowns that was the first performance in those um, those uniforms and they look really sharp they make the kids feel so tremendous when they they get dressed up and everything is, is beautiful and it just it raises the level of performance when they feel like that thank you very much yeah thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Back to you, Mike. Back to me. 2013 Safety Awards. Uh, the Safety Committee is a great pleasure to inform you that five district buildings um, complete the 2013 calendar year with zero employee accidents. And the buildings were the Bus Garage, Franklin Center, Jefferson Middle School, Plymouth Elementary, and Woodcrest Elementary. The Accident Investigation Review Committee presents achievement certificates and gifts vouchers to the Safety Award winners on April 21st during their staff meetings. So great job and, yeah. and we want to keep those accidents as low as we can yeah. keep our rates down. Good job. Congratulations to those buildings for working hard. All right, next up is Linda. Yes, nice evening of warm fuzzies. I uh, <laughs> wanted to draw your attention to a couple of letters that were in your board packet. They were from the American Red Cross and they were thank yous to the district and to Chartwell's Food Services for the support that we gave during the flood in April. Uh, as the floodwaters were rising, we received a call from emergency services saying that they anticipated the need for an emergency shelter and we were able to offer Central Middle School 
a year ago, we had been in a similar situation, and uh, we ended up having Midland High because the entire district needed to be closed. But we were able to house some people at Central, uh, no disruption anywhere in the district. Fortunately, Chartwell's main office is located there, and they just stepped in and offered some support, and both Red Cross, emergency services, and I believe the people there were, were very grateful to the support that the district did. So it's nice the community supports us, but we're also in a position to be able to support the community. So do take a minute and, and read those letters that were in the uh, packet. All right. Thank you. Moving on, we have a long list of actionable items tonight. The first one, do you want me to read the topic or sure, go ahead. discuss? Okay, the first one, item 4.7, is approval of the Midland County Educational <coughs> Services Agency 2014-15 budget, which is what we just um, heard presented tonight at our meeting. I'd add that um, we had the opportunity, um, as well as Linda and, and Bob Cooper were getting exposed, so Bob, Linda and I uh, had a meeting today as well with DSA. and so. From what you saw, we went much deeper and have reviewed those numbers and make sure Midland Public Schools is in the position it should be on their budget as well. Excellent. Well, thank you for taking that time to do that. All right. So this is not a resolution one. So this I'm just looking for a motion. Mm -hmm. Move approval of agenda item 4.7 related to the Midland County ESA's 14-15 budget. All right. Do I have a second? Second. All right, so moved by Dr. Kaminsky, supported by Ms. Baker. So you do actually have a, you do need to read it. Linda, do you, have you always read the full resolution on the, on the budget? No, I didn't think so. No, no. okay. Yeah, roll call vote, right? It's a roll call vote, though, okay. Did, before that, is there any discussion, though, <coughs> before we move into that? All right, so move on, if you could do a roll call vote. All right, um, Vice President Branstad? Yes. Secretary Gorton? Yes. Treasurer Kaminsky? Yes. Member Baker? Yes. Member McFarland? Yes. Member Singer? Yes. All right, so it passes six to zero. Thank you. Next up is the approval of the summer tax rate, Linda. Which does have to be read aloud, so I'll keep the details to a minimum. You must certify by June 1st the tax rate that is to be levied in the summer of 2014 on the property of the school district, which is within the city of Midland. Uh, just as a reminder, we took action back in November to notify the city that we would be doing this. And by levying half of the taxes on the city property in the summer, we are able to levy roughly half of all of our local property taxes in the summer. The remaining half comes during the winter when we add the townships. And that provides uh, some cash to the district during the summer when we go without a state aid payment during the month of September. So it allows us to smooth out our cash inflows and helps us avoid borrowing. And with that, uh, the secretary has a resolution to read that has all of the details. <laughs> okay, and this is for the certification of summer taxes for 2014. Whereas this Board of Education was authorized by the electors of the Midland Public Schools on May 3rd, 2005 to assess up to 18 mills of the taxable valuation of the school district for 10 years, 2006 through 2015, for the general operating fund, subject to the limitations of Article 9, Section 31, of the Michigan Constitution of 1963 as amended, and whereas Section 1211 of the Revised School Code as amended provides that the Board of Education of the School District may levy 18 mills of the taxable valuation of non-homestead property within the school district for school operating purposes and exempts principal residents, qualified agri agricultural, qualified forest, industrial personal, and commercial personal property from such levy, and whereas section 1211 of the revised school code as amended further provides that if the foundation allowance of a school district calculated under section 20 of the state school aid act for the 1994-95 state fiscal year was more than six thousand five hundred dollars per pupil such school district may reduce the number of mills from which principal residents qualified agricultural qualified forest industrial personal and commercial personal property are exempted by up to the number of mills 
as certified by the Michigan Department of Treasury required for the school district's combined state and local revenue per membership pupil for the school fiscal year ending in 1995 to equal a school district's foundation allowance for the state fiscal year ending in 1995 and may levy that number of mills in succeeding years for school operating purposes on principal residents, qualified agricultural, qualified forest, industrial personal, and commercial, per commercial personal property subject to certain limitations and whereas the supplemental millage rate applicable to principal residents, qualified agricultural, qualified forest, industrial personal, and commercial personal property of the Midland Public Schools for the 1994-95 fiscal year was certified by the Michigan Department of Treasury as 5.6523 mills and whereas the Midland Public Schools has taken the action required by section 1613 of the revised school code as amended to conduct a summer tax levy for 2014 and communicated such action to the city of Midland by letter dated November 12, 2013. And whereas Public Act 38 of 1999 being MCLA 211.39 requires that millage rate assessments be rounded down to four decimal places. Now therefore, be it resolved that there be spread on the 2014 summer tax roll a tax levy on the taxable value of non-homestead property of the school district within the city of Midland of nine mills for the general operating fund and resolve further that there be spread on the 2014 summer tax roll a tax levy on the taxable value of principal residents, qualified agricultural, qualified forest, industrial personal and commercial personal property of the school district within the city of Midland of 0 0.9 mil for the general operating fund and resolve further that there be spread on the 2014 summer tax roll a tax levy on the taxable value of commercial personal property of the school district within the city of Midland of three mills for the general operating fund. And now therefore be it resolved that if the revenues produced by the above levies for operating purposes result in revenues exceeding or falling short of the limits specified in section 1211 of the revised school code as amended, such difference shall be made up in the school district's next regular tax levy in accordance with such section <coughs> and Resolved further that the clerk of the city of Midland be and hereby is authorized and instructed on behalf of the Midland Public Schools to assess and spread the amounts and only those amounts required by the above mills on the 2014 summer tax roll. Excellent. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. I missed something. Can you Ooh. read that again? <laughs> the no, quiz. Now we will have a quiz. Six paragraph, I think. <laughs> All right. Thank you. You are welcome. I need a motion. My motion for approval of uh, action item 4.8 for the summer tax rate. Support. Okay, moved by Ms. Singer, support by Dr. Kaminsky. Is there any discussion? Thank All you right. to the taxpayers. Yes, thank <laughs> as, you. As always, for supporting Midland Public Schools. Now, does this require a roll call vote or a voice vote? It, it's really a preference. You can do a voice vote. We will do a voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, passes six zero. All right, Linda, you are Wonderful. up next again. Yes, it's been a busy spring and we bid two of our major services, which sets us up quite nicely next year if having uh, bids in place for major services remains a part of best practices. Uh, but it was time to do this anyway. Uh, the U.S. Department of Agriculture requires that all food service management contracts be rebid every five years. And it's a fairly lengthy, detailed process that is very, very well controlled by the Michigan Department of Education. And in fact, I was not permitted to bring this item to you tonight until they had approved of everything that we sent them and that they were able to sign off that we had followed the appropriate process. Uh, but we do have their approval to bring this to you. So we issued a request for proposals earlier this spring and only one company, Chartwell School Dining Services, chose to bid on our program. Uh, they have been our food service management provider since 2007 and their estimated cost is $2.89.1 per meal. Uh, and as a couple of enhancements to our program, 
Uh, they are offering a reimbursable placement of some reimbursable vending machines in the high schools, and these allow students to receive the meals that qualify for the federal reimbursement, which is very important to the success of a food service program. Uh, and they will be able to get an entire reimbursable meal out of a vending machine. So for those students who don't want to stand in line, they'll be able to get it from there. And then we will have another option. Uh, we are going to be the first Chartwell district in the state to have our own food truck, okay. which will also be able to uh, sell reimbursable meals or provide reimbursable meals because these are part of the free and reduced lunch program. Uh, as well as a la carte items, and we'll be able to use it, uh, you'll certainly put it in school parking lots, perhaps capture some of the business that, that comes flowing out of those parking lots, but also <laughs> use it for fundraisers <laughs> and various school events. It's just going to be a, a, you know, a neat little uh, perk, I think, for, for our schools and our, our district to have our own little trendy food truck that mm -hmm. will provide that. So they're very excited to, to try that on us. They said they thought we were uh, you know, willing to be innovative and that we would find that interesting. So looking forward to that. Uh, so we do recommend to you that we approve the agreement with the Compass Group USA, which is through the Chartwells Division. And after we've done that, we do have, need to have documents signed by the President of the Board, which then gets sent back to the State of Michigan for the final approval. But this contract would go into place on July 1st. All right, excellent. Do I have a motion? I move approval of item 4.9, action item 4.9, the food service contract. Second. All right, so moved by Gorton, support by McFarland. Is there any comments? I'm excited to see what's on the food truck. Mm -hmm. I, I Me am too. too. <laughs> How are you going to decide which school to send it to? <laughs> the rotating yeah. basis. I think it'll travel back and forth. Is this primarily high school? Are we yeah, talking I for food so. truck? Yeah. Okay. And then the vending machines, will the benefit uh, of that be that they'll be available 24 7 for kids who are they in the can building be available uh, so if I'm yeah. staying after for after school practice sure. I can get a as a federal program there are some limits as to what time various foods may be distributed for example oh. breakfast food can't be available after 10 30 in the morning oh. really the rules regarding the federal food service program are, are pretty incredible and hmm. in print that's about this this big uh, but yes, it will make food available at other times. Is this a refrigerated vending machine? Yes. Or? Oh, okay. So will there be hot food on the food truck? <coughs> yes. Oh, yeah. Yes, they're you know, looking at chicken tacos, mm -hmm. food truck kinds of things, yes. <laughs> Carnitas. It, and a lot of that will vary uh, depending on, on what gets purchased. But uh, you know, according to what their their work, they've determined that uh, foods from Latin regions will be very successful. So, so they'll put a big sombrero <laughs> on the truck. Yeah, we'll the truck be decorated. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sadly, the rendering of it is pretty bland. So oh. I, I hope they spiff it up a little. <laughs> All right. We will do a voice voice vote. All those in sa favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed. All right. Passes six. Okay. Zero. And I should have mentioned uh, that Carol Lauchs, our business manager, was very instrumental in helping with the RFP. Uh, it, it is a huge endeavor, involves providing a tremendous amount of data and uh, a lot of detail work that needs to be done, and so she was very helpful. And then uh, we also bid our custodial contract services, and I need to thank Mike Muggenberg for his assistance there because he really worked with uh, our, our past RFPs and also with those that some other districts had issued. And we had some input from our, our current custodial services provider on how perhaps to better communicate what our needs were. So we began contracting for custodial services in 2007, the same time we began contracting for food services. And since our upcoming, or our current contract with Grand Rapids Building Services expires on June 30th, we decided to <coughs> issue a complete request for a proposal earlier this spring. 
uh, unlike food service, we had seven custodial services companies that submitted responses. And we had a district committee of members of the administrative and managerial staff review the proposals, then meet with representatives of three finalists, and then we toured other districts that are served by these finalists. So after careful evaluation, we bring to you a recommendation that uh, superintendent be authorized to enter into a three-year contract with EnviroClean of Holland, Michigan in the amount of $1,235,171.38 mm. $235, per year. And that is roughly $165,000 less per year than we are currently paying. One million, I'm sorry. One million, two thirty-five, one seventy-one and thirty-eight cents. All right. Do I have a motion on the custodial contract services contract? Sure, I'll motion to uh, have our superintendent uh, enter into the three-year contract with EnviroClean of Holland, uh, item 4.10 for action. Support. All right, motion by Singer, support by Gordon. Is there any discussion? I did have a couple questions. The, the people that are the custodial um, workers now, are they going to stay retained? Because of that familiarity with the students and the buildings and That'd be a, that would be a pretty obvious question I'd get from the community, yeah. I think. Yeah, in well, fact, well, I, I can jump in here because okay. I probably have a little more up-to-date information. Uh, EnviroClean is going to be here on Thursday hosting a meeting for the existing employees to talk about their opportunities to reapply with the new company. Okay. So. Because I know that happened before with the switch before when we privatized mm -hmm. that. And most of the personnel because I'm just thinking of the contact with the students in the building and and such yeah yeah that that's part of the consideration and we selected a company that was able to offer wages and benefits that we thought would be attractive to the existing employees rather than request requiring that they take a pay cut okay. so we're, we're hoping that many of them will move to the new company and, and then looking at the um, the references surveying other buildings that was satisfactory other school districts were happy yes. with mm -hmm. okay. are there any local school districts any near us that use the uh, no we will be the first in this area okay. uh, they in Viroclean serves a number of districts it's based in Holland as you would expect mm -hmm. quite a few on the western side of the state and then they have uh, a growing presence in southeastern Michigan okay. quite a few districts there so we will be the first one in this region. Uh, interestingly, our three finalists this time were exactly the same three finalists that we had in 2007. And then they've all grown since that time. Are we, I mean, what we bid, was it the exact same services that we currently have? Uh, no, on the advice of GRBS, we changed uh, how we specified some of our services, particularly in regard to summer cleaning, uh, because after working with us for a number of years, they, they were very helpful on being able to say, here's what we have learned with working with you mm -hmm. that we believe you should make sure that you incorporate into ne your next RFP so that anyone working with you understands this is the way that you expect to have it done. So we, we did have some changes, uh, okay. and the, the largest was how the summer staffing will now be maintained within the individual buildings rather than moved as a, a group of cleaners across the district. Mm -hmm. We worked with all the building managers on what they thought would best meet their needs. Okay. Any more comments, questions? All right, we'll do a voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, passes 6-0. All right, it looks like we're back to you, Mike. Yep, I'm recommending that the Midland City Educational Support Personnel Association contract be extended by one year. Uh, the one-year contract would have no changes from the current contract, and we'll carry them through the 2014-15 school year, expiring on September 30th, 2015. All right, do I have a motion? 
I'll move that we adopt Mr. Sherrill's recommendation regarding the Massespa contract. All right. Support. All right. Moved by Mr. McFarland. Support by Dr. Kaminsky. Is there any discussion on this? Can you tell us again who the Midland City Educational Support Personnel are? Yep. Uh, go ahead. Maintenance. Okay. Grounds and Grounds and maintenance. Grounds and maintenance. Mm -hmm. All right. For people who may not know. Okay. Any others? All right. We'll do another voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Passes six to zero. All right, who wants to take the next one? I have another recommendation to uh, for the board to approve the 2014-15 school year calendar that we recently ratified with a letter of agreement with the Midland City Education Association. And it basically is the same calendar that we had this year with legislative changes allowing us to uh, continue that way for one more year. All right, do I have a motion? Move approval of item 412, um, the 1415 school year calendar. All right. Support. Okay, move by Dr. Kaminsky, support by Ms. Singer. Is there any discussion? Just a thank you for working on that. There's a lot of changes and requirements that go into instructional days, and we've got to account for snow days and everything else, and that remains to be seen, but just a lot of work on everybody's part, administrative and teachers. I was expecting to see more days this year when we talked about the PD days and how the state requirements uh, had us not exactly. being able to count the yep. PD days as instructional days, which makes absolute sense, but they did give us a year uh, sabbatical on that, so we've got a little time. Till the next change. Till the next change. <laughs> yes. mm -hmm. it looks like a good calendar. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I highlight again, it looks like Christmas break is once again two weeks, and spring break is March 30th through April 6th. I know those are, those are two key dates, which I know we're out there already because those are countywide, but just for the public to know. All right. Any other comments? J just curious, how, how would the calendar be available? That'll be posted on MPS website. I think uh, there was tomorrow. a date that says after tomorrow Tuesday. Morning. There'll yeah. be a oh, number Tuesday, of people that are tomorrow. interested <laughs> for planning family <laughs> vacations, I'm sure. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I knew I read Tuesday. I don't know why I was thinking that was later than tomorrow. Um, all right. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right. Six to zero. Calendar will be out tomorrow morning. Moving on, curriculum and instructions. I'm assuming you did not have a meeting since the last, so we will go on to okay. Bob. I guess you're still doing yep. this. Job uh, for good a while. evening. This is for information only. I'm um, bringing to you three textbooks uh, for the 28 day period of examination. Uh, there's one for healthcare technology, one, one for auto tech, one and two, and also car care. And then also there's one for AP Advanced Chemistry. And as always, those books are available for review outside uh, my office curriculum and instruction. Thank you. Moving on to finance. Dr. Kaminsky, we yeah. met. Yes, we met, and we have a short report to read. A lot of it we've covered already in action items for the agenda. Uh, but we met on April 21st. Uh, myself, uh, Ms. Branstant, Mr. Wasserman, Mr. Sherrill, Linda Klein, Carol Loggs, and uh, Mr. Cooper met. Ms. Lux reviewed the March financial report. Uh, Ms. Klein stated the seven companies responded to the re uh, request for a proposal for custodial services, and one company submitted a response to the food service management proposal, a lot of which we covered, and action items took place already on this, uh, uh, this meeting. Uh, the committee discussed the format of the budget workshop to be held Monday, April 28th. Uh, at that time, we looked at the three scenarios uh, presented by the School Act, Aid Act proposals, uh, which are the three scenarios of the governors, the House, and the Senate. In all three cases, the revenue would be less because of declining enrollment. The 1415 budget would be presented at the June 9th Board of Education meeting with action taken on June 23rd. Uh, the next meeting is Monday, May 19th at 4.15 p.m. Right. Short and sweet. Thank you very much. Linda, do you want to go over the yes. gifts? <coughs> there are yeah. many. Gifts, uh, monetary gifts of $8,081.42. Donors are the Dorothy O. Minical Business Education Endowment Fund at the Midland Area Community Foundation, supporting BPA and DECA trips to national events. Mr. and Mrs. James L. Fur 
Fulkerson supporting the forensics team at Jefferson, Siebert PTO supporting kindergarten books, an anonymous donor for the summer reading program at Siebert, the H.H. Dell High School Athletic Booster Club offering support to the pom-pom team, girls soccer and football coaches clinic, and the East Lawn Elementary Student Supplemental Education Endowment Fund at the Midland Area Community Foundation providing support for a teacher book study. We also had the donation of three automatic external defibrillator alarm boxes, AEDs, uh, given to Chestnut Hill, Siebert, and Plymouth by the Pulse 3 Foundation in partnership with Mobile Medical Response and the Saginaw Spirit. Excellent. So we Very thank nice. all of our donors. Thank you. Very much. All right. For action. Yes, and this is perfectly time with Mrs. Peretz's mm -hmm. presentation this evening because she showed you a picture of some of the band uniforms. <laughs> and it, as a result of that generous gift from the Herbert H. and Grace A. Dow Foundation for the two high school music uniforms, we have been in the process of ordering replacement marching band uniforms. You may remember not too long ago I brought you those for the Dow or the Midland High School uniforms and it's now time for Dow High School. And as we needed to do with the Midland High uniforms, we did need to go with the original supplier. Ordinarily, a purchase of this size would be put out for a general bid, but we, we did bid, but had to meet the specifications exactly. So this purchase will be made from Stanbury Uniforms, the supplier of the original uniform. And they are able to match everything perfectly to the uniforms that we purchased in the past. No other vendor is able to do that. Uh, so we seek your approval for to issue a purchase order for $21,640 to Stanbury Uniforms of Brookfield, Missouri. All right, do I have a motion? Move approval of item 6.4, the uh, purchase order to uh, repair the uniforms for $21,640. Support. All right, moved by Dr. Kaminsky, supported by Ms. Baker. Is there any discussion on this? Just glad that we can that we can do that. Repair and not replace. Yes, mm -hmm. I, I was amazed by the presentation earlier of how much money in the short period of time that they have managed to raise to immediately update a lot of these uniforms. It's just wonderful support from the community on another program. All right, we will do a voice vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? All right, passes six to zero. Moving on to human resources, it looks like there wasn't a meeting, so we will go to you, Gary. Okay. <clears throat> the board and staff uh, extend their deepest sympathy to the uh, families of the MPS retirees who have recently died. Rosemary Lauer, who passed away on April 14th. She was a teacher at Leapart and Siebert for more than 24 years, retiring in 1986. Mae Pearson, who died May 1st, she was a secretary with the Maryland Public Schools for 21 years, retiring from Sugnet Schools in 1981. Mary Jane Perkins, passed away April 29th. She was a human resources secretary for us for 20 years, retiring in 1980. And John Byron, who passed away on April 18th, he was an industrial arts teacher at Northeast Jefferson and Dow High for 20 years. He also coached football and wrestling at Northeast, and he retired in 1990. <clears throat> now our next um, memoriam is not for a retiree. As you well know, we lost one of the Midland Public School family uh, this past uh, 10 days. Um, Mrs. Jennifer Grace Sisko was a much loved, dedicated teacher math department head at Midland High School who lost her very courageous three-year battle with breast cancer on May 2nd. All in was the battle cry that was heard and felt through not only her Midland High School family but through the MPS family. For all of us who cared for and supported Jen in her fight these past three years. And I see some of you have your pink shirts on with the all in slogan on it. We send our heartfelt thoughts and wishes to Jen's family, her husband Mike, her children Rachel, Blake, and Lauren, and her extended Cisco and Turner family. The wonderful light and spirit of Jennifer Grace Turner Cisco will live forever in our hearts 
Yeah, during public school. Thank you. Their thoughts go out to all the families. All right. Next up, correspondence to and from the Board of Education. You can read um, letters from the board to different individuals and also a list of our next, um, well, I guess the rest of the Board of Education meetings through the end of the year, which brings us to our study discussion session, hearing from board members. I'll start with you, Pam. Great. Uh, first, I'd like to echo the sentiments for Jen Pisco. She was just a fabulous teacher and a just a, a great member of the Midland High, the Midland Public Schools family, and it's really hard to see see uh, it end like this. But a lot of people uh, gathered in support at Midland High for a memorial, and at Memorial Presbyterian, it was neat to see the community really rally um, around her cause. So hearts go out to her and her family. Um, Looking forward to the commencement coming coming up and our kids graduating. Um, also, uh, the, there's been an art show over at Midland Center for the Arts where the uh, Midland and Dow students have a lot of different uh, pieces of artwork on display. And if you haven't gotten a chance to get out there and check that out, it's a neat display. <coughs> I thought it was neat tonight when uh, we saw that there were seven bids for copy paper. And I thought, you know, um, when you're really trying to pinch pennies and, and save money wherever you can, you, you know, you got to feel proud when you're going after even uh, the, the copy paper and making sure that we're getting uh, the best bang for the buck. So appreciate all the hard work that goes into uh, looking at all the details. That's all I've got. Oh, OK. Um, boy, what a long meeting tonight. This was a, I, I thought it was a real treat, though, to have the kids come in and perform for us. And you know, maybe for members of the community who aren't so engaged in the school, I would encourage them to come to our meetings because they are getting uh, increasingly interesting with, with the different performances and presentations. And it really, I think, gives everybody a good flavor for what goes on um, you know, in our district. Um, congratulations again to our, our shining stars, um, you know, just everybody who has donated uh, to make all the all the great things possible and the, the things that we're able to achieve. Um, beyond that, you covered uh, a number of the things that I had in mind to talk about. So uh, with that, I will pass comment. Well, I agree with you. I think um, these presentations here, I always really look forward to them. And I just I learned so much. And they're just so exciting to see all the really exciting things that happen at, in the middle of public schools. I really enjoyed the musical presentations tonight. And I've always been amazed at how much music Mrs. Parrots and Mrs. Murray and Mr. Stevens get out of our kids. It's just amazing to me. And also I want to mention that Mr. Uh, Stevens was a Gerstacker Award winner last week. So congratulations to him. And um, I think I'll cut it off there. <laughs> Lynn, I'll hear you. Well, I uh, congratulate the Gerstacker Award winners as well. And uh, I'd like to thank Yvonne. She did a, a wonderful job in her speech. <laughs> she did a great job. And, uh, recognizing, helping recognize our four winners and uh, our shining stars tonight as well. It just shows what great staff we have and how much people appreciate them and like to recognize them. Uh, Pam mentioned the Midland Center for the Arts Art Show. Uh, I stopped over there, but I'd like to thank them too for um, hosting so many of our schools. The frog exhibit was going on and <laughs> even when I went over the other day, there was a Midland Public School bus there. There were buses from other places and that takes a lot of volunteers and time on their part. So we appreciate their partnership with us in, in doing that. Um, uh, went to see Dow High's musical uh, Xanadu the other night, so congratulations to them. Once again, great performances, so much talent from those students and a lot of hard work from uh, all the people that are involved with those, those great productions. And uh, so the robotics went to the world championship. So just lots of different groups doing just fantastic things representing uh, Midland Public Schools. And today we visited uh, the Building Trades House with the Curriculum Committee. And that is always so much fun to see what uh, our students are, are building. Those houses are absolutely beautiful. And uh, there is going to be an open house to the public on Saturday, this Saturday the 17th from 10 to 2. And it is 
at 1128 East Haley Street, which is right next door to the uh, Habitat for Humanity Restore. So I'd encourage anybody that can to stop by there and, and see the wonderful uh, homes that they have built. And then lastly, um, my heart as well goes out to the Jennifer Cisco's family, but I'd like to thank Midland High and all involved for the, a beautiful memorial service. They're, they estimate about a thousand people were there and it was very touching, very heartfelt and um, it, it was, I know, hard for them to have to do that with their emotions being worn on their sleeves, but it was absolutely wonderful and uh, I thank them for taking all the time to do that. Okay, that's hard to follow up. Uh, but uh, you know, I agree the, with you all, the, the meeting was full of a lot of uh, good things that are going on in the district and really showcasing the talent of our teachers, our students, and what's going on with the, uh, uh, with the performances, music program, and so forth. Um, thanks for those, again, who worked on the calendar. It's a nice collaboration to get that done, um, and it is challenging to try to hit a moving target on that. Um, and then uh, I missed Gerstacker Awards, but one thing that I remembered um, going through that process last year is that a lot of the teachers, a lot of the winners, had, uh, had become mentors for others, and that's just a way to mentor along and to grow and inspire teachers to go to the next level. And I remember that was just a key component of the Gerstacker Awards, and thanks to the Gerstackers for uh, uh, supporting and continuing that tradition. Um, also, I'm thinking of Jen wearing the shirt tonight, and the, um, the support that came out really spoke volumes to the lives that she touched and <coughs> how uh, she made just one person, how they can make such a difference in MPS. I was very impressed. Um, and then uh, I think Teacher Appreciation Week passed last week. Um, and just uh, if you had a chance to thank a teacher, um, you still still is time um, to uh, to do that, uh, even though it is uh, last week. Um, and then the safety awards. It's nice to have that element brought up by the superintendent. You know, just the just that you think about kids safe on uh, school buses in and out of buildings, parking lots are busy, and think about our employees. And that's really is a important part. So I'll hand it over to our. All right. President well, I think for tonight. You guys have covered a lot, but once again, congratulations to the two shining stars tonight. Those are wonderful presentations. Congratulations to the Ger Gerstacker Award winners. I love the presentations from Plymouth and Chestnut Hill. It's wonderful to highlight those. Um, I noticed we had accepted some money, and there was something in your Monday um, letter today about um, the DECA group at Dow High and the BPA group at Midland High going on to these national competitions and just how fabulous that is. We um, have a couple friends who got to go this year on those and it's just so great to see these kids going out and representing our school district and representing it very well um, at these national and I believe international competitions. Um, I know AP exams are going on last week and this week so this is going to be my shout out to a teacher. I'm sure they're all doing this, but my son is taking a couple this week. And the teachers go above and beyond to help prepare these children to take these exams. They don't just expect, I mean, my son has been going to review sessions after school on weekends. And it's just, I really appreciate the teachers going above and beyond. They don't have to do that, and they just do because they really care about their students and want them to do well on these exams. Um, Lastly, I know prom is this weekend, so hopefully everyone enjoys themselves and behaves themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and on to you, Mike. The Gerstacker Award's been mentioned many times tonight. Let's talk, actually announce the winners. So we had Jeff Beckwith from the sixth grade teacher at Jefferson, you know, Mary Ann Leposky. Uh, Adams fifth grade teacher, Roger Stevens, MPS music teacher, and Lynn Tolfo, Woodcrest kindergarten teacher. We also had 25 retirees. Um, many of them we recognized that evening with a total of 641 combined years of service in public education. So wow. that was pretty impressive mm -hmm. and will be missed dearly. Um, our office professional administrative assistants have sent us what they call their salary request and they're on asking for no salary requests this year because of the economic conditions of the district, but they do want to be considered if the economic situation turns around. They haven't had any increases since the 06, 07 school year. So that's a no salary increase request, no not salary. a no salary request. Right? <laughs> Correct, okay. excuse me. Good, good question. Just thought I would clarify they would that for them. That, I'm sure. yes. <laughs> 
teaching staff assignments for the 2014-15 school year was released on May 23rd, so be aware of that. And um, our ongoing facility studies progress, um, French Associates have been in looking at our closed facilities at this point and beginning to study those. Um, they have requested that we move on and put our RFP out for our contract manager. They want the assistance on the contract contract manager and they're estimating for the projects and those costs and so that is out and due May 23rd so we'll have a very FFO meeting to schedule real quick here in order to review those and um, hopefully bring this uh, construction manager for approval at our first year meeting. Lynn has also been in contact with Starter Birch, our financial consultants, because we have to begin to look at the financial side of that as well and um, working some numbers up on that side. U.S. News and World Report has recognized our high schools again, third, time, third year in a row, both as silver medal winners. Um, some stats to help you with, put that in significance is that our high schools are in the top 7% in the state but maybe even more impressively, they're in the top 10% of high schools in the entire country. And those are basically built on IB and AP um, participation as well as results. We have a structural issue at Northwest or Northeast Middle School. Um, we had in 2006 some storage buildings built on the second floor. Uh, one of them may not have the proper um, trusses structure underneath. And so we're in the process of having that an analyzed and look back at our work back with our architect at that time on what we may do and try to recover any cost through that piece of it. Obviously, that area has been vacated uh, as we do that. So, school aid budget and May revenue consensus numbers are coming out soon. And so, you've been seeing in Lansing that the House and Senate moved their budgets forward, uh, but you may also need to know that. The thought is the numbers look like that the May revenue consensus, the numbers may be down. So we haven't seen that in a little while. Um, numbers have been increasing, and that's yet to be seen how much that will affect the final school aid budget as we go forward. We'll end with that one. Budget All right. numbers. Thank you. Is there anything else? All right. So 9-11, we will adjourn.